start the bidding with one bar of gold press Latin. Hello and welcome to the Collector's Corner, a supplementary edition of the Divine Treasury. My name is Mike Bovia, and on the Collector's Corner, we get to know the people behind the things we like to collect or those who assist us in that collecting. We've talked to licensees, manufacturers, authors. Uh, we've, we're working on getting authenticators and grading experts, all things that are necessary for today's collector. And today we're going to look at the auction world. But before that, I do need help for all the heavy lifting that's involved in doing this show. Now, despite what he might gain monetarily, if his collection went up for auction, he would definitely be in a corner crying. So let's welcome my co-host, the overly emotional Jamie Rogers. Uh, Jamie, how goes it today? Well, that was uh, quite the introduction there. Um, although, I don't know, if I keep going, I may have to uh, try to get rid of... Uh, <laughs> Sacrifice. So, yeah, some of these items uh, through auction here, but uh, doing okay. A little uh, work's been a little hectic this week, but uh, I'm excited to, to have this conversation. So as mentioned before, we're diving into the auction world today. And you heard us talk about the auction that the folks at Prop Store were doing last month with items from Star Trek Discovery. And here to discuss that and other elements of the business, including an upcoming auction that features some Star Trek items, we welcome VP of Business Development and Operations, Chuck Costas from Prop Store. And Chuck, we're so happy that we were able to have you come on and uh, discuss everything that you guys are doing over at Prop Store today. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a fun business to be in, in the auction business. And, you know, ultimately the, the best part about it is actually just connecting with fans of whatever properties it is, whether it be Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, Marvel stuff, um, but being able to help bring some of the authentic things that were used in making people's favorite series and movies to, you know, to, to their collections. So uh, well, I'm sure we'll delve into that today, but uh, glad to be here. Absolutely. So maybe we could start off uh, if you have like a quick Reader's Digest version of the prop store history and how sure. the business got started. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll make it more of a fairy tale. Um, now, it started over 20 years ago. Uh, Stephen Lane, who is the CEO and is based out of London, um, he started the company. And, and I think it started more as, you know, you can look at it as treasure hunters. I think Stephen is one of those folks that is sort of realized early on, he sort of asked the question, hey, where does this stuff end up that when they're making a movie or a television show, where does it end up after they're done with the productions? And so he was one of the, the early people that tracked down these things and, and, and found people from the productions. Um, he was very much into Star Wars um, as well and sort of tra tracking down those stuff, that stuff very early on, um, but, uh, you know, started going out, finding collections of this stuff and then, you know, offering it to the public. And back in the day, it was a, a website only where you could, we would put a lot of stuff up at as fixed price items uh, and offer them to the public. Um, but over time, I think it's, yeah, it's hard to keep track of time, but sometimes around eight years ago, uh, Prop Store get, started getting into auctions. And I think that there were sort of two components of that. Prop Store does um, sort of the treasure hunting, if you want to look at it that way, to find the vintage content. And we do two auctions per year, one out of the London office now and one out of Los Angeles. And the Los Angeles office was started, uh, I think, 13 years ago or so by Brandon Allinger, who's the COO. Um, but the so there's two of those auctions that are the vintage content. And a lot of that content comes from collectors that have had it for a number of years. Uh, or sometimes it might still even come from original sources of people that worked on the films or uh, television shows, uh, and they just happen to have it in their collections. And so we bring it to market that way. We do a lot of research on that type of stuff because it's coming from various sources. We have to make sure that it is authentic before we're going to offer it to the public. Um, but then we also work with directly with the studios. And I think the, the Los Angeles office specifically, um, we do a lot of work. Uh, in this case, you know, as we talk about the Star Trek Discovery auction, that was uh, partnered with uh, CBS Consumer Products. So uh, CBS, who obviously brings all the, the new Star Trek television shows to you. Um, but we've also worked with Paramount, um, which has done the features. Um, and so we've done Star Trek um, auctions uh, for the 2009 and uh, Star Trek Into Darkness movie that uh, that fans got to enjoy. Um, but And we work with a whole host of other partners, Lionsgate, Le Legendary, 
uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Marvel, you know, we brought a whole host of auctions and we try to produce maybe, you know, somewhere between eight to 12 uh, studio auctions per year and bring those. And those are really things that are coming directly from the sets um, to, to the fans. And so you, from a Providence perspective, we don't have to do quite as much research in that we know it all came off the set and, 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 and it came from the production and then now we're putting it in the hands of fans. Cool. So uh, you kind of touched on uh, an additional question that I had, but I, I think I'll mention it anyway. I'm assuming that back in the day when things first started, uh, the company was reaching out to the studios to see what you could get to put up. And I'm going to I'm going to also assume that now that relationship's a little bit different where they're coming to you with stuff that that seemed like a like I'm yeah, on the I right mean, line. My, my job as head of business development is really sort of building that relationship with the studios. So I look at it as at this point in time, I think we we have relationships with almost all of the major studios. Um, and, and we try to keep a line of dialogue up around upcoming projects and what makes sense to auction and what they're comfortable with. Um, sometimes, you know, very frankly, production comes first as it, it, you know, when you're making these things. So if there's going to be a sequel for a movie or if they're going to be an ongoing television series, um, they may want to keep things. And I think it's, it's, it's frankly, it's, it's cheaper to produce uh, or cheaper to keep things than it is to sort of make an extra in most cases. Um, but after they're done with a lot of these productions, we will end up with it. But I think in the case of uh, Star Trek Discovery, as we'll talk about here, this was a little bit of a unique case. And it, this is a, a sort of a newer trend where CBS was willing to work with us while the production is still going on. And so we literally went up to Canada um, and actually selected things off the set, which is, is a little bit rare. Usually on the television side, they will wait until the production has wrapped and then they'll deal with the assets after the production is wrapped. But in this case, I think, and especially unique to the Star Trek crowd, we really wanted to keep the Star Trek you know, fans engage. And it's a really great way of hold, hosting these auctions to not only give them a, a piece of sort of what's going on in the current world, um, but it, it just becomes more relevant, gets them more excited about hopefully the upcoming seasons and things that are happening there. So I think we wanted to create sort of a, a special relationship with this discovery auction of, uh, of actually getting things that were sort of still in production and still being used uh, and offering those to fans uh, while the series is still going on. And hopefully it continues to go on for, for a while longer. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, we're, we're heading towards season four, I guess in a yep. few weeks. So yeah, there's still quite a bit that, uh, that could be had at this point. So and you mentioned that you have the LA auction mm -hmm. and you have a UK auction. Now you just recently did the auction uh, for discovery props. So was that, kind of like a uh, a supplement that, yeah that was a we, we do as i as i mentioned we do these sort of two tent pole auctions about every six months uh one out of la and one out of london but those are everything so you'll find anything from austin powers to x-men you know it, mm -hmm. it kind of goes across the gamut of different properties there's you know hundreds of of different titles that we'll have in there it could be something as small as like top secret you know a, a title that you very rarely see anything from uh, or it could be something as large as Star Trek or Star Wars, which obviously are bigger properties, uh, and where we may have you know hundreds of items that are, are that are for sale in those catalogs. So I think the current catalog has over 1,100 items, I believe, in it mm -hmm. for the UK auction that's coming up here, and that's going to be uh, between November 9th and 11th is the end dates for that, and that'll be a live auction, and those are done live. Uh, but we also do studio auctions, and, and so the Star Trek Discovery auction was just dedicated on items from Star Trek Discovery and, in this case, also short treks uh, that were sort of part of that Discovery world. Um, and we focused primarily on seasons one and two, although there was a few items in there that were reused in season three as well. So we tried to attribute those uh, to season three. Obviously, we when we got the stuff and when we prepared the auction, uh, really didn't have much insight into what was going on with season four and uh, and obviously if we took the things they, at that point in time, which was we, we actually collected the stuff from the set right after they had finished um, season three or when they were in the process of, of, uh, of, of finishing up season three. Um, so we had some you know, good insight as to what, what had been used on seasons one, two, and three at that point in time. Well, so <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to be a little ignorant here for a second. So you mentioned uh, the UK auction is a live auction. Now, I worked at, a, at an auction house before. So to me, Live auction means you've got an auctioneer up there shouting out numbers. Um, but in this case, it's mostly online. 
So does that mean, you know, there's a specific amount of time that each item is up and you go in order of it and people have that time to bid and increase and however, however that goes through? Uh, yeah, I think with the live auctions, um, and I apologize, the discovery was an online auction. So it was really okay. anybody in the world can bid. It was online. There wasn't a, a live auctioneer. With our live auctions, there is a live auctioneer that is okay. calling this. And so uh, with the with the online auctions, they're times. And so we basically, one every minute will end. And then if somebody places a bid in the last minute, it'll extend the clock on that particular item. So you, there is no sniping as you would find in eBay on that. So it's a little oh. different format. Yeah, everybody kind of, I mean, it's always yeah, kind of like that. you feel cheated when somebody came, comes in and, and snipes you on something. Yep. But um, with a live auction, there is a live auctioneer. So it, it comes up lot by lot. And so, you know, if you're on lot 151, you know, it'll go, we'll go through all the bidding for that. That usually takes about a minute um, per item, you know, give or take. Mm-hmm just depends on how intense the bidding is for that. And people can bid on the phone. Um, and so it's a, what we'll do is some people will prefer to just be on the phone and we'll have somebody call from the auction house uh, and be on yeah. the phone with that bidder and Ring actually man. bid live as if they were in the room. And in, in today's world, we've had to adapt the business a bit where we used to have you know big live settings for doing these things. Obviously with COVID for the last couple of years, we've mm-hmm. adapted where it is still quote unquote live, but it, it's really more people are participating online. The live component is the fact that there's a live auctioneer and there are people actually bidding for phone bidders in the room uh sort of as if they were you know bidders in the room at that point in time but uh but that's for the bigger we do that for the big auctions we do occasionally do uh some of the studio auctions as live auctions as well but for star trek discovery here this was we, we did this as a, an online auction and, and again i think it's just uh there's it, it not necessarily one is better than the other um, but we felt like that was the appropriate thing to just allow people to to have a chance to make sure that they were bidding on on the catalog of things and it seemed to work out well. So we, we were we were happy with the way that it all all played out. I appreciate that explanation because it makes me not feel as ignorant as I thought I was going to be. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> well, especially with COVID, it's changed the definition of what is live, what isn't. Right. Uh, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, yeah. And, and I think even when we've done, as far as our business goes, we've had to adapt with COVID uh, we, where we typically would also do live previews. And, and in this case we did, we actually were able to do a live pre- preview at Star Trek day. Um, so CBS had invited us to Star Trek day, which was taking place at the Skirball here in Los Angeles. And we were able mm-hmm. to set up as, as if it was a convention, but it, we actually got to be outside. So we had a nice little patio area where we displayed some of the costumes and got to talk to fans about it. And that would be you know, what we would typically do either at a convention or we'd set up uh, another display to do that. So it was great to do that. Um, but in some cases with some of our other auctions, we will preview and allow people to get on a Zoom call with us and talk through the items if they've got questions about you know, either the, the item itself and we could show them the labels that are in there or what th- something is constructed of. It, it gives us a, a chance to really interact with fans one on one. And that's something I think is a good thing that comes out of COVID is just are the innovation uh, and in the fact that you know, a lot of people are all over the world. They're not only here in Los Angeles. So not that, you know, we don't want to limit who can actually come and see the items. And so I think that's another great way of just connecting with fans all over the world. Going back to something you said before, you mentioned um, that at this point, you pretty much know that the items are coming directly from set. So does that mean that, all right, let me, let me ask the question differently. Does prop store then provide a certificate of authenticity to the buyer, or is it just something everyone at this point knows that everything is coming from from the set, essentially? No, that's a good question. Um, and yes, we do. We a prop store, whether you buy in our sort of tentpole auctions for the year, the, what we call our entertainment memorabilia live auctions, or you buy something on our website, wh- whatever you buy from prop store will come with a certificate of authenticity. Uh, but specifically for discovery, um, and this was a very cool thing, sometimes we'll create custom COAs. And in this case, um, Alex Kurtzman himself actually wanted to be part of the process and actually co-signed each of the COAs, you know, guaranteeing that this was stuff that came off of off of the set and was part of the Star Trek universe. So they're actually co-signed by myself and Alex Kurtzman. Uh, and they we put, you know, exactly what those are. I think, you know, what we can, you know, what we can say is this was something that was used in the production. We don't, you know, I think a lot of times we will try to go so far as to try to screen match because I think in the world of collecting, you know, movie props and costumes, trying to screen match it and know that this is the one that appeared Mm -hmm. on this scene. 
you have to keep in mind that in many cases there are multiple costumes you see right especially when somebody gets injured you know you see that you know that there's a hole in the costume that gets formed because they got stabbed you know here and, and maybe they've got a little bit of, of blood on them or something like that and that might grow over time they typically have different stages of what they call distressing in this business and so you might have five laurel costumes um, depending on sort of the different stages they also have a, a stunt version of that for the stunt actor and then they will have the the main character and there might be multiple changes for that so keep in mind that there isn't in the world of of collecting movie props and costumes whether it's a prop or a costume there isn't just one of anything um, but what we don't necessarily do for the studio auctions is go through and try to tell you this one was used in exactly this scene because there might you know the scene might actually have used four or five different costumes at different points during that that scene itself although it looks like the exact same costume to uh, the naked eye, so to speak. But you know, we, we can guarantee that this stuff is coming from the set. And I think we allow uh, the people that are buying these to do a little bit more research and hopefully they, they will be able to find whether, whether this particular costume that they're buying matches to a very particular scene. That makes a lot of sense. So when you and I were talking before, Chuck, you had mentioned that um, a prop store has been uh, you, you try to take into account what your buyers might be looking for and the range of items that they might be able to purchase. So uh, care to expand on that? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think as I think a lot of people think about auctions and you, you hear about the items that sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think that's, that's sort of what the press latches onto. Obviously big numbers get big attention. But when prop store structures an auction, we really look at trying to provide a wide variety because I think there are different collectors. Yes, there are people that want to spend $100,000, but the average collector can't you know, spend that kind of money. Um, they're looking for a variety of different things, anything from autographs that might be sort of less expensive, um, you know, to background costumes, to the key character costumes. And so when we structure an auction, we, we try to make something available at every price point. Um, and especially when we're working with studios, one thing I find is that the studio auctions, very frankly, the stuff that's being produced today doesn't go for as much as maybe the vintage stuff that everybody else is looking for. It hasn't necessarily found a price point yet. Um, and, and a lot of times we'll release hundreds of items all at once. And so there is a sort of a wide variety of different things you can choose from, which also keeps the prices reasonable. So with the discovery auction specifically, we started everything at $100. Um, our, our, you know, our thought process on that was, you know, we want to, it, it'll obviously get bid up to whatever it is, but we want to make it accessible to everybody. And we don't want to put any kind of uh, price reserves on any of these things. So everything started at $100 and just got bid up from there. Um, and obviously, some things stayed closer to that $100 range. I don't think anything actually sold for exactly $100. Um, but, you know, obviously, some as we'll get into prices here, some things went into tens of thousands of dollars. And so, but when we structured the auction, we, we knew that we would have different content um, that would appeal at different price points to different people. And, and as you say, too, we also want to make sure that we have variety, um, you know, from Klingons to, you know, to Starfleet uniforms, to background things. You know, some people collect, you know, want to put something to put on their wall. So we want to make sure that we had some set deck pieces we had some very cool vulcan masks that i thought were just you know amazing especially if you put a, like a light behind them they would just display so well on your wall um you know to obviously costumes that people might want to wear at a, uh, a cosplay event uh you know when they go to a star trek convention or something like that so um you know finding the right variety of things actually took a while and it, it took a lot of conversations between us and cbs to make sure that we could have the right variety of material available for the auction uh, when it ultimately got launched. Um, which one surprised you the most, The where people had a lot of demand for or maybe went for a price that you didn't even think was even, you know, possible? Um, I think, you know, I wouldn't say it surprised us the most. I think the badges, uh, we weren't quite sure how those were going to do. Um, you know, in the past... It, you know, Discovery was very special as it related to the badges. And, and just to give people a little bit of background on that, typically, if you looked at past Star Trek productions, a lot of the badges were plastic. They were sort of stick on. Um, they went on the costumes, but they, you know, they were all interchangeable. Uh, with Discovery, as, as most Star Trek fans know, they actually created uh, a special badge where the pips were actually on the badge, which actually created a different dynamic. Where I, I can't remember exactly if it was 26 or 28 or 24, exactly how many, but there was, there was a number of different variations 
um, you know, and, and every badge for every character, you sort of needed a, a specific badge, although some characters shared, uh, I guess, the same rank. And so they could be interchangeable between a few. So the, the, the one of the badges, we actually had a, a Captain Pike badge, uh, which we knew Pike was going to be popular. We just didn't know exactly how popular he was going to be. But we had one that was attributed to him that we knew that he used. Uh, and that closed with a $14,000 hammer. The one that was a little bit more surprising is we had another hero Captain rank uh, badge that went for even more. It went for 17,000 and it wasn't attributed to Pike. So it was kind of surprising in some ways that uh, a, a sort of one that couldn't be attributed to a specific character went for a little bit more. But I think that was part of a mentality of, of you know, somebody really wanting the Pike badge um, and then maybe thinking, assuming that the one that sold later that wasn't identified for a particular character would go for less. But because it was the last one that we had, it actually ended up going for more, um, you know, as far as the bidding goes badges i mean if they were going for that much i mean what did you see with the uniforms what what kind of interest did the uniforms garner obviously yeah i mean um the, the, again pike was the standout character here uh and i think you know I, I think it shows a lot of enthusiasm for strange new worlds it's coming up and i think that's a great sign i think everybody has sort of uh attach themselves to that character already. Um, but I think it was also sort of a scarcity thing. So we, we had obviously a number of different blue um, you know, Starfleet uniforms. And, and obviously they, there was three sort of main variations, which was obviously the silver, bronze, and the gold. And then there was the mere universe costume. So we had a number of different ones. And frankly, they all looked very similar to each other. I think what was a little surprising was that there were you know, because they all look very similar and on a mannequin, they would look similar. There was definitely from fans, a very specific character that they wanted. So Lorca was uh, one of the characters that really stood out. So I think his main captain costume went for $18,000 hammer um, where, you know, a background costume, you know, would probably average somewhere around a uh, thousand and it would look probably very similar to that. Um, but obviously the, the Pike did very well. That was the, the high seller with a $29,000 hammer price on it. Uh, but that was the only uh, sort of yellow pike costume that we had for sale in, in this. And it was really his, you sort of look at it in the history of Star Trek, it'll be his quote unquote first appearance costume that he had. So there weren't, you know, even if they do make more pike costumes down the road, there aren't going to be that many more of that particular costume ever available. So I can understand why that there would be a, a strong desire from a fan perspective to own that particular costume. Yeah, and obviously wasn't in Discovery for very long either because he was mostly in the blue. So um, now, Chuck, can you talk me through the whole bidding process? Like, how did that work? Did, was it all done online? Was it did, did you have people phoning in things as well? Um, yeah, for, obviously the, for this I've, one, it was, I've, yeah, sure. It was all online for this particular one. No phone bidders on this. So everybody had an equal playing field to to bid against each other. And the way that it would work is you would see, we set a, a, a specific time that each uh, lot would end. I think we scheduled it a minute apart. And then if somebody bid in the last minute, it would just reset the clock so that, that people could continue to bid and they didn't necessarily have to snipe or, or, you know, sneak in at the very last second and, and try to win it. So it tried to, to level the playing field from that perspective. And, you know, we thought that that, that worked very well because as you looked at the auction, things were spread out. So you could sort of, uh, you could bid in advance. And that was the other thing too, is that we did open the auction on September 2nd and it, it ran through September 16th. So you can go on September 2nd and place all your bids if you want. And it would only advance, you could, you could put in a, a higher bid, but it would only advance it up to, you know, the, the, if somebody else bid underneath you, then it would advance your, your bid up there so that, you know, it, it's a, it's a very easy way of bidding there. And, uh, but we did find most people came in the day, the last day of the auction and placed those last minute bids against each other. You know, it's sort of how people are conditioned to, to bid these days. Yeah. I, I like that there was no sniping because uh, Jamie and I often will be messaging each other back and forth saying that we were the leading bidder up until a second before close and got sniped. So yeah, we're either the, the snipey or the sniped one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you probably want to be the snipey rather than the snipe, but yeah. Oh, in fact, I'm I'm getting ready to be the snipey pretty soon with some, with some of these uh, the new uh, autograph cards that just came out. In in typical Jamie line. fashion, he's bidding during a show. 
No, no, I'm, I'm not doing it right now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to balance work right now other than the, <laughs> than the show, but uh, that'll, that'll be later on, Michael. <laughs> so Chuck, one of the things that I got to say actually surprised me when I looked through the discovery catalog and, and the results was the uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland book. Uh, was that a surprise to you how how high that ended up going? Uh, yes and no. Um, I sort of had my eye on that one to wonder if it was going to go. It, it probably went a little higher than I expected, but I, I guess I equate it to the Resican flute, right? We, and, and Prop Store actually sold in our entertainment memorabilia live auction in Los Angeles uh, a few months ago. We sold the Resican flute again, and I think with you know hammer price and buyer's premium, it went for two hundred thirty-seven thousand five hundred, which is a pretty hefty sum. And it sold years ago for I think around forty-eight thousand, if, if my memory serves me correctly. But I, I look at it as a similar piece, where if you love that character, and obviously Burnham is the main character in Star Trek Discovery, um, it's an object that really sort of summarizes the character's sort of spirit in in one object. And I think that's what people recognize in that particular book. Uh, so it stood out from the rest as far as, you know, whether it's a phase or other things she might use, it really embodied the character. And I think that's what people sometimes look for when they're looking at these props. And, well, uh, I, and I was going to say too, I, I, I think it really connected her character to Spock as well. And, and I mean, you know, things that, that have anything to do with the Spock character and the Star Trek universe generally, <laughs> you know, do very, very well from, from an auction standpoint. So I would think that that connection to Spock as well. And, you know, Spock's heritage definitely helped the cause. Yeah. But yes, a lot for a book. Yes. <laughs> for a prop book. Yeah. For a prop book, yeah. So, all right. So we've talked about uh, the discovery auction and, you know, that is now in the rear view mirror. So let's <laughs> fast forward to, uh, as we discussed briefly uh, earlier on the show, the UK entertainment auction uh, that's coming up. And there are 13 items, if I counted correctly, that feature Star Trek. However, I I've got to believe that uh, knowing our audience, uh, a lot of the stuff in that auction uh, would be of interest to them. Um, you know, the things I was, the things I was showing my daughter as I was going through were uh, the hoverboard from back to the future Two, which I saw is the cover of your catalog. Um, a number of Star Wars items. Uh, so I think uh, the question that I have to lead off about talking about the UK auction is, is it UK only? Or if you know how to convert pounds to dollars, are you able to bid in that auction? <laughs> um, okay, I guess good first question. Um, just because it's being held out of the UK doesn't mean that all currency isn't accepted. And in fact, I believe this is the first auction that we are going to be accepting cryptocurrency as well. So if you have that as well, you can actually bid in the auction. Um, but no, it doesn't require, it, it ultimately when you pay, it will be converted into pounds. And so when you bid in pounds, uh, you know, keep that in mind that you're not bidding in dollars, but uh, it will make it easy. Credit cards these days make it very easy to pay for things uh, in a different currency. So. Uh, anybody all over the world can bid in this auction, uh, and uh, the majority of the items are being kept uh, in the UK, and so they will be shipped out of the UK. Um, but you know, we always consider these, whether they're out of Los Angeles or the UK, uh, worldwide auctions. And a lot of our buyers are, you know, frankly scattered all over the world, whether it be Australia or China or other places. Now, now I know Mike kind of talked about the the hoverboard, but what are some of the big the big ticket items, you know, that you want our listening audience to to know as part of this auction? Yeah, and I'm sure we'll get more into the Star Trek ones. Um, yeah, I think some some cool things is we've got a screen matched Wilson. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, you know, we don't necessarily always screen match things, especially when we're coming from a studio auction. Uh, but when we get the more vintage content, we, we do try to do that as much as possible. And uh, there's always like very specific flaws on things that you can look at to try to match it. And this is a, a screen match uh, Wilson from, you know, that, that, that Tom Hanks spent a good portion of his time on stranded on an Island. So that's, that's a very cool piece that I hadn't seen before um, for Blade Runner fans. There is a screen matched uh, Harrison Ford or a photo match, excuse me, um, 
uh, Harrison Ford shirt from Blade Runner. Uh, so the Rick Deckard character, we have that as well, which I think is also a rarity. You, fi- you rarely find anything from Blade Runner, uh, and especially to find something that's screen match is very cool. Um, also, given that it's sort of Christmas season, one of the one of the specific movies that I wanted to try to find things for, it's always tough when you're doing these auctions because it's like, I would really like something from this for fans, but you can't always find it. Um, but we were able to find a, uh, a bunch of items from Elf. And so there's a great selection just in time for the Christmas season of Elf. So there's a, a Wolf Ferrell uh, hero Elf costume. We also have the rocket, uh, if you remember, that falls off of the sleigh. Um, we have one of those. Uh, there was actually two of those, one that burnt up and then one that was, uh, the, I guess, the hero clean version. And we have got the clean version of that. Um, for Jurassic Park fans, we've got, uh, you know, fr- we've got a, a crushed uh, Jurassic Park vehicle, which looks very cool. Um, for horror fans, we've got a Freddy Krueger sweater uh, from uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. So those are just kind of cool. We also have a, a Jason hockey mask. We sold a, a, a screen match version of that for over 200,000 in the last auction. Um, this one is not the same screen match one, but looks very similar to that, so, so very cool. Um, James Bond, we've got a screen matched uh, Sean Connery suit from uh, You Only Live Twice, which is always very cool to find James Bond items, very hard to find out in the marketplace. So, uh, you know, I, I've gone through a number of different titles there and we've got a whole bunch more. There, there are hundreds more, whether it's Harry Potter or others, you'll hopefully find something in the auction. Uh, that you like, uh, including uh, Star Trek. And oh, and I guess on the space front, from a, a series that I also watched sort of alongside Star Trek, which was Space 1999, we've got uh, one of the Eagle transporters, one of the actual models that was used for uh, you know, f- filming the space scenes on those. So that, that, that also brought back a lot of memories from childhood for me. I was hoping I noticed- you were going to name that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say too, I noticed you got a lot from, uh, from Aliens as well. Uh, a pretty decent sized catalog. Did you get all those from the same, from the same source there as well? No, I mean, especially when we put these auctions together, always coming from different sources. Uh, you know, even the elf items didn't all necessarily come from one, one particular place, uh, even though it looks like a collection. So um, no, they didn't come from the same place, but yeah, we do have a, a great, uh, we have a pulse rifle that's in there. We had a, uh, we had one in our previous auction that again, did very well. Um, and here, this is a stunt version of, of the pulse rifle that we have uh, for sale. But yeah, always, always get, you know, aliens. There are certain titles that we always try to find things from. And I think aliens, predator, star Wars, star Trek, those are sort of staples of every one of our auctions. Um, things like elf though, you know, smaller movies, not as much stuff that's necessarily floating around, you know, not necessarily any sequels out there. So not as easy to, to find things from very niche movies, but we, we try to find things for, you know, frankly, we, we know that there's fans of almost a whole bunch of movies out there, and we try to find as much of a variety as we can and put those in our catalogs. So uh, we mentioned there is Star Trek items in this um, in this auction coming up. Uh, one of the more unique things I've got to say that I saw uh, within the Star Trek catalog was a portion of Data's arm from the Next Generation, and. Uh, Jamie's head just perked up because of his next generation uh, collection. Uh, so um, we talked about how with discovery, everything came directly from CBS. So uh, I'm assuming some of this stuff because of dates that would be associated with some of this uh, product that's in here came from a, a number of different sources, as opposed to just from Paramount. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, as I, as I talked about with this auction, a lot of what we do is either coming directly from collectors that have had collections of this. Sometimes you'll find, you know, it, I would say it's always sort of obvious, but sometimes you'll see where we have three or four different costumes. They may have come from the same collector and same collection where they were trying to assemble things. And frankly, they've just decided at this point they can part with things. Um, but we do find it, it, it is coming from multiple sources. And a lot of our sources are people that worked on the films uh, and may have, have gotten it. They may, you know, it may have come from special effects companies that were making things for this and got the items back. Uh, it may be people that worked on the sets and the items were gifted to them. And very frankly, they also, a lot of times, especially in the 80s and 90s, they would have parking lot sales. And so after a production was over, rather than doing an auction like we would today, uh, officially through some someone like Prop Store, they would just allow sort of cast crew employees, people that worked on the set to go buy items um, you know, for relatively reasonable prices. And so some people sort of stockpiled those and put them in their um 
uh, in their, you know, in their garages, but they could also, sometimes stuff was thrown out. And a lot of times, and that's, that's the shame of it with a lot of these productions, especially the large set deck pieces, they end up in trash cans, which, you know, part of our message is we want to, you know, we want to be able to offer these things to fans, but it's also a way of being sort of environmentally green. And, and if you're going to destroy or, or do that, um, it, it's a shame when you have to put things into a landfill. And so we try as much as we can to work with the studios to keep things out of landfill, to put them in people's collections that will sort of love and care for them for future generations. Uh, but yeah, in, the, in these cases, most of the material, although it could come from the studios, uh, a lot of the material could, uh, you know, a lot of it does come from collectors or people that were in the industry that have this stuff. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say it kind of, it kind of made me think too of like and how star trek is kind of unique because a lot of times they would take certain set pieces and move them from one production to another and then it went into the warehouse obviously but you think of like a movie like like a blade runner let's say that doesn't do well and you know commercially didn't do well where's it going to go from there that they're, they're not thinking of any sequels until it becomes a cult classic so all that stuff's just going to go in the garbage or, or, or get sold to, or given away to people. I mean, I, I think I even remember the TNG bridge, the next generation bridge being just basically trashed and thrown out to the, you know, to, to the back curb. So that's, it's, it's definitely interesting uh, hearing you talk about that process. Yeah. And that's why it's great, you know, that we're, you know, we, we typically do work with the studios these days to help them make decisions around, frankly, what's, you know, uh, what we didn't talk about is the archives, right? A lot of companies, uh, including Paramount, which obviously makes a lot of the Star Trek films, they have an archive where they keep what they consider is important, whether it be for a marketing display 50 years from now or just things that they want to reference for future productions. They will keep an archive of sort of the key important stuff. But as we also talked about, there could be five versions of a costume and the archive might keep two of them. But they may not necessarily need all of them, especially this maybe the stunt versions of those, and that's where we try to come in and uh, you know make those available to fans. Uh, but in some cases, you know, and especially in years past, those same costumes would have either uh, you know they would have they'd gone on these sidewalk sales, or they you know unfortunately could have even been thrown in the trash, which is which would be a shame. But um, you know there were there you know back in the days as well, there were people that were sort of keeping their eyes out for a lot of this stuff. But a lot of if you think about like uh, a lot of your television productions today a lot of that stuff ends up um, at secondhand stores because it's just normal clothing and so they end up recycling it um, and it might be a may, it may have been worn by your favorite actor but they're just selling the pair of pants because you know it's a pair of pants that somebody else can wear and reuse at this point in time so that's what ends up happening with a lot of hollywood stuff or you even see this stuff getting put into trading cards too i mean that's yes. th th that's <laughs> a whole different you know thing that didn't exist 20 30 years ago um, but now it's very prevalent today and it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a very big market. So, that, you know, you're not going to see as much of these things sometimes because of, you know, being put in trading cards. <laughs> That's true. I, I always hope that they're taking the ones that are sort of like ripped and, you know, that wouldn't be as, as, uh, desirable, you know, uh, but who knows what, you know, exactly where they're, where they're sourcing all these things from. But, um, but I, actually, I'm sure that some of the costumes we've actually sold have ended up as trading cards, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. But uh, uh, I, I would, again, we're, we're sort of into the preserve. We, we sort of hope that a lot of these things are going to be preserved by collectors out there and for future generations. And, I, you know, it's funny, I end up, uh, you know, my personal collection, I, I, uh, I have a lot of Marvel stuff that I've had whether it be comic book, original art or other things. And I've, I've tried to lend it back to museums as they need it, um, you know, for, for exhibits. And I, I hope Star Trek fans also, you know, uh, will keep their things. And if they're needed in the future, you know, we'll be generous enough to lend them to, to people out there. Yeah. I've actually been to a few different uh, museum type shows of Star Trek, CBS, Paramount. And a lot of times you do see the credit down bottom lent by, you know, X, whoever doing the same thing. So, yeah, that's a it's a real nice thing uh, that you do and that other people are doing. So yeah. kudos to all that uh, that do that thing for our enjoyment. Yeah, I think that, I think the Star Trek community especially is very generous and uh, it's a great community and very loving community. And it's great to see the sort of those acts of generosity. Yeah, yeah, Mike. One thing we didn't touch on that uh, you know I'd like to touch on, which was as part of the Star Trek Discovery auction, um, it was great. And I don't know if you guys watched these videos, but Susan Nimoy actually put two items from Leonard Nimoy's collection into the auction. Yep. 
That was one of and, the things I wanted to ask about. So yeah, yeah. It. So let's let's talk about that. Um, you know, first uh, I have to say, Susan and, and frankly the entire Nimoy family have been amazing to to sort of get to meet Susan, uh, talk to her, and really just understand just how much they want to give back. Uh, in this case, the two items that we sold, and we sold uh, Leonard Nimoy's pinball machine and a um, a set of ears from Star Trek Into Darkness, which was Leonard's last portrayal of the Spock character and, and sort of very significant from that perspective. Um, she wanted to donate that. And every year, they actually the Nimoy family actually donates money for um, COPD research at uh, UCLA under uh, Dr. John De- Belpario. And, um, you know, to see her excitement, you know, the fact that we were able to raise some money for, for this and give back. She really wanted to do everything she could to sort of connect with the fans. And so she recorded videos with us talking about Leonard, talking about his life, talking what Star Trek meant to Leonard, as well as these particular objects. I thought it was just very generous of her to do that because she doesn't make very many public appearances these days. And for her, you know, for this being a cause that she really believed in and, and the fact that she also wanted to reach out to Star Trek fans and connect with them again, uh, I thought was a very special occasion. And I'm glad that this auction could help, help provide that uh, as, as, a, as a way of, of her sort of being able to connect again with the community. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, and very, uh, you know, the Spock years uh, on the surface, not all that unique, but as you said, it's the last, it's the, it's a set of years from the last time he portrayed Spock. And then that pinball machine, man, that's a real unique uh, piece, especially because of who owned it. Yeah, and I have to say, it's been sitting outside my office here, and I've uh, I've played it on occasion. It's a pretty amazing uh, pinball <laughs> machine, and uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, just to, you know, for people that didn't follow along, the Spock years hammered for uh, nine thousand dollars. They were nicely framed. Uh, Susan had mm-hmm. they when they got them. I think I think JJ had actually given them, gifted them to Leonard at the end, and they actually had them framed up very nicely. So couldn't have any better provenance on those. Uh, and then the pinball machine itself, I believe that that ended with a hammer price of, if I'm not mistaken, seventy five hundred dollars. Which you know, frankly, for that pinball machine, is it's a pretty good deal. I mean, I think they they yeah. typically sell maybe a little less than that. Uh, but pinball machines in general have been very collectible, and just the enjoyment of that, knowing that you're playing Leonard, you know, one that not only Leonard played on, but the entire Nimoy family sort of uh, played on, uh, is just something great to think about every time you're playing that pinball machine. Right. Absolutely. So my last question, and I, you've alluded to this a couple of times uh, in our discussion here is what is the time frame that it takes for prop store to put together just one of these auctions? Uh, well, I'll take the, the questions separately. So we do do, like I said, we do one out of Los Angeles and we do one out of London each year. And I think it's really sort of a year long process for each of our auction or for each of our offices to try to collect uh, different stuff for that. Um, it, typically, I guess there's a six month cycle and we do the, the Los Angeles office may contribute things to the London auction and vice versa. Uh, but it's usually a year long thing. And we're really sort of thinking about the end product, almost like a curated museum exhibit. Um, for a studio auction, uh, this is an interesting story in that we originally plan on having this discovery auction um, last year, actually in 2020, <laughs> and uh, everybody knows what happened in 2020. Um, I had made a, a, my set visit up there. I, I went up there to the set, as I said, when they were finishing season three, which was in March of 2020. And because they film in Canada, what ended up happening is they ended up closing the borders between Canada and the U.S. shortly after that. And so even though we had made the selections of things that we thought fans would want for the auction, we couldn't actually get them down from Canada to the U.S. for almost a year uh, because the borders were closed and because we couldn't get, uh, you know, frankly, the the sets were closed um, and the people that normally worked uh, on Star Trek couldn't necessarily get access to the sets to help us finalize and get things off of there. So it took a little longer, uh, you know, it took over a year in this case for us to be able to bring the, that auction to fans. But I do think that that was extenuating circumstances. But we do, you know, I think in general with studio auctions, we try to work a year in advance and sort of plan it out, understand when we can get access to things. It does take, uh, you know, in this case, we had approximately 200 and I think it was 200. We typically do maybe between 200 and 300 items for a studio auction. Um, it just to, it has to go through numerous processes, including what we call our intake, which is going through everything, putting it in lots, um, 
you know, taking sort of inventory photographs of it, getting it ready for our photography team and copies team to write up different descriptions around, uh, you know, and, and to fill out sort of what we would normally uh, publish on our online auctions or in our print catalogs as well. Um, so it takes, you know, by the time we get things, it typically takes us maybe three to four months to process things at a minimum, um, it, depending on how many projects we have going on at, at the same time. And then we've got to start the whole marketing campaign, uh, you know, coordinating with, in this case, CBS and their PR departments and marketing departments to make sure that we're, uh, you know, coordinating with different things. And in this case, we were working around Star Trek Day. So I think we wanted to make sure that we fit in uh, that, you know, the messaging around it was very clear uh, with everything else that was going on with Star Trek Day. Um, and as I mentioned, we got to be part of Star Trek Day, at least the live events that were going on for Star Trek Day, which was a great honor. So, so Chuck, I'm going to add for my last question, I'm going to kind of do something interesting. So on our show, normally, when we have a guest and we're talking about their collection, we ask them three questions uh, in regards to basically their favorite items and things like that. Um, so I'm going to do the same for you in, in regards to the auctions. OK, so what what item is the most so we, we call it the Grand Nagus Award. So maybe the most expensive item you guys have ever sold that you can remember. Um, and I've only been a prop store myself for about four years. Within that four years, uh, the most expensive item we've sold, at least publicly, has been uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark Indiana Jones hat. And so that went for, it was actually sold out of London, but the equivalent was over a half million dollars for that. Wow. Um, but that was Indy's hat that was worn. It was actually screen matched to a good portion of the movie, which is very cool. And I would love to own that one piece myself uh, if I could, if I could have something in my collection, but uh, yeah, not everybody's got that kind of, you know. All right. To, so to invest in it, but. so now the Kivas Fajo award. So this is the, it's kind of like the white whale. So if there's any item that you could get into your auction to sell, if you had a wish of that one item that's eluding you, which one would it be? <laughs> uh, is, is, is are we going to limit ourselves to Star Trek, or are we going to put nope, ourselves? Nope. In you can world? whatever item in the in the world. Um, I would say in the prop world would probably be like a um, lightsaber from Star Wars, like a a Luke or a Darth Vader lightsaber. Um, I think that would be in, in one that's proven i hate to say there's been a lot of ones that are more alleged than anything else in the, in the world of props but if we could find a true sort of screen matched version of one of those i think that would be very significant and then the last one we call it the resican flute award harking <laughs> back to you talking about the resican flute so the yes. one that holds the most sentimental value to you so what item that has traveled into through prop store and gone out do you kind of have a, a connection with um, I, I'll talk about one that, uh, I guess it, it did indirectly come through prop store. Um, I am a big, uh, fan of Marvel's the Punisher. And so, uh, something that meant something very important to me, not the most expensive item, but I had Tom Jane's costume for, um, the original, that 2002 Punisher movie. It was 2002. I might be wrong off on the year, but um, I did not have the jacket that went with with the sort of the main part of that. And so the uh, the jacket. Somebody actually called and said, "Look, I have the jacket, um, but I'm looking for the person that has the rest of the costume so I can reunite it." And it was one of these odd things where um, I happened to be that guy, and it was just like you know he was he was he was a very nice person. He was just like, "Look, I, I really just want to put the costume back together." And so for me. You know, it was it was nice that that person really wanted to do that, and for me, I you know I was the other person that was very happy to to reunite those, and I you know love that movie. So I think you know wasn't the most expensive purchase in the world, but to me meant a lot to just because I I had bid on that and whatever it was when the auction originally happened in the early two thousands, and I didn't have enough money for it, and so um, it was nice to to be able to reunite those two pieces of the costume. So that was that was a great thing. So. That's such a great story. Yeah. It is. And I like that uh, that you dovetailed a normal episode into that, Jamie. That's actually a really cool piece that we were able to <laughs> to uh, thread in there. Sorry, it wasn't Star Trek, though, in this case. But uh, no, no, not, no, that's fine. That's if fine. I had to have a Star Trek piece, I would I would love to have a, you know, a, a original phaser from the original series. But uh, oh, wouldn't we a lot all. of people <laughs> would as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to have one just to be able to sell it to continue my, <laughs> my purchasing. Uh, 
uh, I would probably keep it, but yeah, I'd find other things to sell. That's a very cool piece. Yeah. Well, from November 9th through November 11th, you can bid on various entertainment items in the UK location auction from Prop Store, the entertainment auction, which includes 13 Star Trek items. Uh, go to Prop Store. Oh, go for it. I All think right. it's actually more. There's actually two sections. Yeah. If oh, you go okay. online, you may not notice it, but if you go in the catalog on day one, there's a number of, of Star Trek items. It might be the 13 you're talking about, but then okay. afterwards on day three, I believe there are a number of other things like storyboards and artwork. And uh, there's a whole bunch of items that you can. I definitely didn't. I definitely didn't see those. So yes, yeah, check yeah. it out. So there's, there's even more. And I would also say if you go to propstore.com, um, we actually have items available right now that you can buy that are Star Trek related. So we've got original comic art, we've got storyboards, costume designs, masks and appliances from Star Trek Into Darkness, autograph items, crew items, costumes. Uh, take it, take a look at that, and you can buy something even today from Star Trek. And uh, you know, I hopefully in the future we'll we'll continue to do uh, other auctions that will include Star Trek content for fans. Uh, but we just love the the Star Trek community and uh, glad that we can play our part in uh, contributing back. Well, his name is Chuck Costas, and he is the vice president of business development. And what was the other part? And operations. operations. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be an interesting piece together that I do there. Yeah, I think I need to shorten my title a little bit. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for joining us, Chuck. We definitely appreciate you coming on and uh, and talking about uh, this auction, this auction. Uh, whole auction world that's out there for us to spend our money on my pleasure guys <laughs> live long and prosper everybody <laughs> is there a product or collecting service you'd like to hear featured on the collector's corner message us at divine underscore treasury on twitter until next time you've been listening to the collector's corner part of the divine treasury on the trek geeks podcast network the divine treasury connecting through collecting. Music for the Divine Treasury is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. The Divine Treasury is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.